Ladies and gentlemen, players, coaches, I'm absolutely honoured to have with us today Commonwealth and British light heavyweight champion Callum Johnson. Callum, first, mate, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. It's not often that we get joined by a champion, a boxing champion. Um, so we are very grateful to have you with us today. Callum, mate, obviously I know you pretty well, but let's uh, tell the audience a bit about yourself, your amateur career, your professional career so far. Um, well, as an amateur, I, uh, I had around 120 amateur fights, winning, winning about 100 of them, and I finished my amateur career winning Commonwealth Games gold medal. Back in 2010, it was a while ago now, um, and as you see, I'm a professional fighter now, and I'm British and Commonwealth flyweight champion. I challenged for the world title over in the States. Um, I come second in that one, though, but you know, my, my aim is to get back to that world title mix and, and try and try and get that world title fight. That's brilliant, mate. I can, uh, I can definitely remember that fight. I was sat biting my nails um, back across in the States when I was here as well, watching you. And um, for me, that fight, the, the little uh, knockdown in the, I think it was round one. Yeah, it was. Um, a... I think that was a bad refereeing decision. Yeah. I know I'm biased to you, mate, but how did, how, what did you feel about that? Are you... Uh, Happy to comment on what your thoughts were. Yeah, I thought it was a bit of a cheap shot, wasn't it? You know, you know, I've made through the ropes, the ref jet stop, and I've turned out. I thought I was safe, and you know, the next thing I was, I was knocked into next week. Um, but it is what it is. It's one of them. I, I recovered. I got, I got back up, and I, I got him. I knocked him down in the second round. So I had my moment. I just never took it when I got it, and you know he he, he ended up finishing off in the fourth. So it was a, it was an up and down fight, an exciting fight, and a fight that I'd very much like to have again, just to see if I could do it because I genuinely believe I could. Um, but you know we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Absolutely, mate. Absolutely. So growing up, mate, did you always want to be a pro boxer, or was it something at a certain age or a certain level you thought, you know what, well, I'm pretty decent at this? Yeah, I think it was. I think I remember people asking me that question, did you always want to be a pro? And I think, you know, the first time I ever went to the boxing club as a kid, I, I don't think I even knew what professional boxing was. Right. So I don't think I really thought about being a professional fighter. It wasn't until, as you say, I got a little bit older and started thinking, you know what, I'm pretty good at this. You know, I might, I might be able to do something in this sport. And it was like that. And I think I was about 16 you know, when I started kind of realising I had something about me. And that's when I started taking the sport seriously and uh, kind of made it my life. You know what I mean? I dedicated my life to it. And, and, that's, and that's where it really started when I was about 16. Nice. So you as obviously a young lad, went down the boxing club for a bit of fitness, turned out pretty decent, got your gold medal in 2010 in Delhi. Is Delhi right? Yeah, it was Delhi, yeah, uh, Delhi and India. Um, so that's, that's a great achievement, really good achievement. Obviously, you said it's something that at an age you got to and you thought, yeah, I'm going to be pretty decent at this. Before boxing, was there anything else that you played with, football, soccer or whatever? Yeah. Um, I, did, I, did, I, played, I, played, I played football or soccer, as, as you call it over there. And, you know, I, was, I, I, knew, I knew after two or three games I was never going to be any good at that. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I might as well stick to the boxing because I couldn't even kick a ball straight. Um, but yeah, no, nah, but I've done also as a kid, you know, I used to do like inline skating and skateboarding, BMXing and things like that. You know, I, I like every normal kid. I did a bit of everything. Um, it just turned out I was pretty good at boxing. And, you know, it's something that just kept drawing me to the gym. You know, whether it was punching people or, you know, whether people punching me, I don't know what it was. But there's always this sense of, not just after a fight, even after a training session, there's always a sense of satisfaction. You know, I used to walk out of the gym and I just feel good about myself. I'm talking now, even as a 12, 13 year old, you know, as young as that. But I just, as I got older, and the training got more intense and the fights got more important and everything else, the, the sense of satisfaction got higher and bigger. And, and yeah, just, it was just like a, a, a progression. It just happened without even realising it was happening. Yeah, yeah. So you, you've always been gifted at giving a punch and 
we'll say taking a punch. You've uh, given more than you've taken. Uh, but growing up, mate, did you have a did you have an idol? Like for me, my idol was David Beckham. Uh, for yourself, did you have an idol outside of boxing, or did you only have idols with inside the boxing career? Um, to be honest, my idol growing up outside of boxing was always my dad. Yeah, I idolised my dad. Um, in boxing, as a young kid, obviously everyone loved Nas. Yeah, I remember watching Nas at two, three, four in the morning with my dad. You know, I love Nas. But as a, as an older teenager, Ricky Atten, um, you know, I was a massive fan of Ricky Atten, and I was lucky enough to go and spar with him and things like that as a young teenager. So I had some great experiences. And and they always say about you shouldn't meet. Sometimes they say you shouldn't meet your idols because you can be very disappointed. But the first time I ever met Ricky Atten, you know, he was like he was just everything that everybody thought he was and says he was and he was a great guy so he made me feel he made me feel a million dollars and uh, but yeah Ricky Atten and Prince Nazim inside of boxing that's amazing mate because correct me if I'm wrong was Prince Naz your first manager when he you was turned? yeah, so yeah how, was. That, how was that mate obviously you've you've idolized him you've you've watched his fights numerous times people know him all over the world and there you are you've just come off a, a win of a gold medal You've gone to pro Korea and look what happened. You've got Prince Naz as your manager. What what feeling did you have? How was he as a manager? What what was it that was, like to you? It was surreal. It was surreal. It was it was kind of it, again, it all it was all like a whirlwind, you know. I'd got I've got come back from India, I've won this gold medal, you know, I'm like all over the press, all over the big papers in the UK and you know, everyone's talking about me. And then the next thing you know, I'm I'm sat down around Prince Nazim and his house talking about him being my manager. Yeah. And it was like sort of come out. I remember leaving his house, driving home, and just thinking, is it, is this real? Is this actually happening? But as far as um, Nazim being a manager, it never worked out that well, really, because through no fault of mine or through no fault of Nazim's, just the, the first stages of a professional career just didn't go to plan. Um, again, I just didn't get the fights. I couldn't get the fights. And, you know, it's kind of had three years where I think I had six fights in three years, which, you know, I should have had that in the first year, to be honest. It just didn't work out right. But sometimes in life, you know, things don't work out right. And you have to kind of face these obstacles and, and get over the hurdles and, and just keep moving forward. And, and that's what I've done. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously, for me, boxing is a very courageous sport. You are, for, for my, just from my point of view, going into a boxing ring is just, it blows my mind. You've got nothing but yourself there and another angry man in front of you that wants to take your head off. Um, but, mate, you represented your country in Delhi in, in the Commonwealth Games. Um, in the final, that gold medal fight, when that, bell, that final bell rung and you knew you'd won gold, can you remember that feeling, what you had? Yeah, I'll never, ever, ever lose that. I'll never forget that feeling because, again, it's everything I ever worked for, everything I ever dreamed of and, and everything, you know. It's like, you, as a kid, you know, and you start, you see these big events on TV and you have these crazy thoughts and these crazy dreams that one day, oh, imagine if I could do that. And, and then before I knew it, you know, I was there. I, I, was, I was at the Commonwealth Games. I was in the Athletes' Village. I was having this massive opening ceremony. I was holding the flag because I was a captain of the boxing team. And then I have the first fight and I win that. And I think, oh, I'm one step closer. I have the second fight and I win that. I think I'm, I only need one to win one more fight. And I've got myself a medal. And I win that. Then I think in one more fight and I'm in the final. And before I know it, I'm in the final and, you know, you think, wow, I'm here. I'm, I'm actually here. After all these years, all the hours I've put in the gym, I'm, I'm, I'm here and I'm doing it. And I remember being in the ring and you can, you half know what's happening. You half know how long you've got left because you've got that little clock in your head that you kind of remember and you half know what the score is as well. So I knew I was winning and I knew basically I only had to get through the last round and I'd won the fight. And uh, I remember there was about 10 seconds left to go. And I just remember just stepping back and just putting my hands up. You know, and there was, still, there was still like 10 seconds to go in the fight. And 
I just started celebrating. And, and I remember when that bell went, I just started screaming and like, just it's everything I'd ever dreamt of and worked for. And it all just, it all just come true and happened for me. And I remember also going back to the athletes village after and being in my room, I'll never forget this. And I lay, I laid in a dark room on my bed all night long, I had the middle on my chest. And, you know, I just didn't speak to anybody, didn't move. And it was, it was like a massive come down. It was like everything that I'd worked for, I'd got it. And it was like, now what do I do? Yeah. You know, and it was, it was a strange, a strange feeling. It really was. Yeah, mate, you, you talking through that and giving me that step-by-step thing, it actually put goosebumps on my, on my body. That was crazy. That was, that was intense, man. That was just the, the talk through was intense. But going into that final fight, did you do anything different or did you find yourself doing anything different before that? You know, it's my last push. Like one more fight, we yeah. did man saw um, it, got the gold medal. Did you do anything different? I wouldn't say that anything different because for for I always I was always dedicated and I always did everything to the best I could. Um, but for the six months building up to the games, I seriously left no stone unturned. I did everything I was asked of doing and more. You know, I ate right, I drank right, I trained right, I slept right, and I did everything. I couldn't have done anything any better. So going into the games, I was so confident, uh, but not not just in my ability, but so confident in what I had done, and and I knew I knew I had everything I needed. Uh, so I went into every fight just with oozing confidence and and knowing I'd put the work in, and and that that that's really. That's really why I think why I performed so well as well because you know just mentally I was so switched on with knowing the work I'd done and I just I had that mindset of how can I be beat with the way I've with the way I've prepared and and, and that's what it's kind of that's what happened when I was out there you know I, I was pretty much unstoppable in that in that tournament. Yeah, you're absolutely right there, mate. Because I think it wasn't so long ago you put a couple of clips up of your uh, final fight at the at the games Commonwealth Games and. I was watching that back, and as you said, you were that confident that for me, that that final fight. Of, correct me if I'm wrong, but that final fight to me looked like a breeze for you. You just looked, as you say, unstoppable. You just come out flying, and I, I think I'm sure it was the final game where you've gone quite a few points ahead. Uh, that the other guy you was fighting, I think he was deducted a couple of points or whatever. But did you feel that? with everything going on in that final game and like you say, your preparation towards that, did you feel as though maybe that final fight was the easiest out of the one because of the occasion that pumped you up, got you ready, your training and, and everything else? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, you say, that, again, on, on paper, the, the guy I fought first was probably, supposedly should have been the easiest opponent. Um, but as you say, the guy who fought in the final, who was a world-ranked fighter himself, you know, should have been a tough fight, as you say. But I did. I just, I say, I was because I was that sharp and I was, I was on form that much, and I was performing so well. I did, I did make it relatively, I won't say easy, but comfortable. I made it. It's never easy, you know. You can, you, you know, in a game of football or soccer, you can go and win four or five nil. But it just it doesn't mean it's easy. It just means that you're performing that well, if you like. So, and and that's what I've done in the final. I just went out there and I produced the best stuff I'd probably produced at that time in my life, um, which made which made the fight from from the outside looking in made it look pretty easy, I suppose. Yeah, no. As I said, you were. It's it's a massive achievement, mate. I have got so much respect not only for you as a boxer, but for you to achieve to represent your country. To achieve that gold medal is absolutely crazy. So you won the gold medal, you come home, you're on cloud nine, you turn pro, you get Prince Naz, everything's going amazing. You, you've had a great career so far, fantastic career so far. Is there any fight that is your most memorable fight in your pro career as of now? Um, yeah, I think it's got to be when I won the British title because... I, I was defending my Commonwealth title as well, the professional Commonwealth title. But I'd had 18 months out of the ring at that time. I'd um, gone through a bad patch in my life, really. I'd lost my father and I sort of went through a stage where 
you know, not only at one point did I think I'd probably never get back in the ring, but I went through a stage in my life where you know, before I get my life back on track. So to, to overcome what I overcome, to get back in the ring was a massive achievement on its own. But then to go and win the British title and, and state my claim as being the number one fighter in Great Britain, you know, that topped it off. So that, that's got to be the most memorable uh, for, that, for that reason. Although not, again, not for the guy who I beat or what I did in the ring, but what I overcome to get back there. Is, is that will always, always been probably my, arguably been my biggest achievement in, in life, that getting back in the ring after that. Yeah, that, that's right. You know, it's, as you mentioned, it's the, it's the British title. Not just was it the British title, what you've gone through, again, massive amount of mental strength, preparation to, to overcome that and to be glorious in such an amazing occasion of winning the British title. It means you're the best in Britain. What, what did that, what feeling was that like? Yeah, again, it's always nice to be uh, rec recognised as the best, the best in, you, in the country, you know what I mean? So, so for people to say to me, you are the best at what you do in your whole country. Again, it's, it's things you dream of, of, of a, as a kid and it's kind of, a, it, let's be honest, it, is, it does give you an ego boost. You know, you, you walk around and you got your chest out because you are the man, if you yeah. like. Yeah. Um, but it was just, again, it's that, it's that thing again, isn't it? You know, that, that achievement, that thing you've chased all your life from, from that young age and, and it finally happened and finally paying off. So, yeah, yeah. Just, just, oh. Sorry. There we go. Life of a pro boxer, mate. You've got crazy kids running around. You've got Jason the Crow flying on your head. You're, you're full of fun. We've <laughs> not got the Crow here. We'll have to, we should have done the interview at Tim's house. At oh, there house. you go. For, for, the audience, for the audience that's watching, um, Catlin's brother-in-law has, has got a new friend, which is the Crow. You will never believe the story. Follow Callum on Instagram um, and you'll see some absolutely amazing things going on with this Crow. But uh, Callum, mate, you, as we said, you're a pro boxer, you're a very successful boxer. Can you give us an insight into your preparation um, for your fights and what it takes to be a pro boxer? Um, you know, it's an awful lot of sacrifice. You know, we miss out on a lot of things. Um, throughout, throughout my whole life as an amateur and, and, and you know, obviously still to this day, you miss out on a lot of occasions, but you gain so much. But, you know, I... I a routine day for me in training camp and pretty much out of camp as well is like I'm up in the morning, I do I have my breakfast, I'll do my training session, you know, and then I'm just resting again, eating again for the energy for the next session. And then I say I'm back in the gym and I'm training two, three times a day. You know, it can be anywhere from three, four, five hours, um, or depending on where you are in camp or, or what stage you are. But it's day in day out because the days you have off the gym, you know, you've got to be, you've got to stay focused on what you're eating, what you're drinking, and how, you, how your routine's going. So it is a, it's a life, it's a lifelong, um, it's a lifelong thing. It doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. You know what I mean, it, it, you know, people see me on telly and things like that, and they see me winning titles or, or whatnot. But the, it's, it's a twenty year process to get to where I've got. Um, and I say I'm still grinding day in, day out. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, it, it, it's certainly one of those things that's great for the athletes of ours to listen to and hear the people that are at the top of the top of their game um, realise what sacrifice and how much they have to put into things to make their dreams come true. Um, we'll talk about dreams coming true. Um, and I'm sure you always dreamed as a, as a young boy, as a young pro of challenging for the IBF title. As we mentioned earlier, that result didn't quite go your way. But what advice can you give to young athletes that, or whose results don't always go their way, the decisions don't always go their way? What advice can you give these young athletes to get them back on track, give them a, get the win in the sales again and go, you know what, let's go smash this, come on. Just for any, anybody starting out um, or, or any level, just don't give up. You know, don't give up. Don't don't listen to to the naysayers, the doubters, because you know if I had listened to everybody that said I was not going to do anything in the sport, or if I had listened to all my doubters and if I'd have believed them, you know, I'd have never done anything. 
Um, you know, so just listen to yourself because whatever you tell yourself is what you're going to believe. Uh, and to tell yourself good things, and that, that's all you can do. And then what will be will be. As I say, don't don't ever listen to the doubters because you know you're going to get that all your life. You can be the best in the world, but you'll still have doubters. Yeah, no, you've hit the nail right on the head there. As you say, going through a boxing career, you've well, confidence comes a key part of it. Mental strength is such a key part of it, um, which we try and teach our young athletes in the side of soccer that we're working with now about mental development. And we do sessions of how to overcome things. And we talk about positive self-talk. We talk about controlling the controllables. Um, for you as a boxer, did you, uh, alongside your training camps and stuff, do you have mental sessions as well? Or does it just come as being a champion boxer and think I'm top dog? Yeah, no, nah, you know what? I, I, don't have, I don't have mental sessions, uh, mental coaching and things like that. But I do kind of believe it's a good thing to have. But I feel as though with the experiences I've had in my life, in sport and out of sport, I've kind of learned to you know coach myself if you like mentally and i've kind of learned what works for me and what doesn't work for me and i feel as though i'm kind of my own sports psychologist you know it's crazy really um, but I, I, I think to myself who knows me better than i know myself um, which is nobody and, and like you say i can't i could i can go to a, a sports mental coach if you like and i can i can lie to him yeah, I can't, I can't lie to myself. So I've figured out a way, I believe anyway, that I've figured out a way to sort of tap into my own mind and, and, and get the best out of myself. Uh, it took, listen, it's took me a long time. It's took me a long time to learn, but I feel as though I'm, 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 I'm nearly there now. Amazing, amazing. That's great to hear because, like you say, boxing, or we mentioned it before, boxing's a, a, as such on the night. It's an individual game. You're there on your own. But um, through your career, mate, Callum, your parents have been a massive influence into your boxing career. Um, how influential are parents in youth sports, do you feel? I think, I think they play a massive part. I think, you know, I don't think they get enough credit really for, for the part of the play and, and I don't know how it is over where you are but obviously where, where I'm from in Boston we don't have a lot of facilities and we don't have a lot of opportunity in sport especially so me as a young teenager needing to get around the country I needed to be traveling like 100 miles here and 100 miles there and and if I'd never had my dad you know being with me every step of the way I would never have done it you know, because I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to do it because it wasn't in my hometown for me to do it. And, but then, not only does my dad make that sacrifice, my mum also makes this sacrifice because my dad's always out with me. You know, so she's kind of left at home on her own, if you like, or, or looking after my sister. So, parents, you know, play a massive, massive part in the success of, of any of any young kid's sporting career or whatever career it might be. You know. And, and I said, I've seen it, I've seen it so many times over the years where parents don't really give give the time of day to, to the kids' profession or the kids' career or the kids' ambitions and they're just the kind of oh, just you gotta do something normal. You you can't do this because you know we're just normal people. And I, I'm just, I was I was always just a normal kid from a normal town, you know, but I had this crazy dream of being a professional fighter and winning gold medals and winning titles and fighting for world titles, yeah. And I went and did it, you know, but as I say, there wasn't many people that believed I would when I was a 16 year old, apart, apart from probably my mum and my dad. Yeah. And, and like I say, without them, you know, I, would, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Yeah, that's amazing, mate. That's amazing to, to hear that we, you, you, obviously one of your idols, as you mentioned earlier, was your father and he played a massive part in your career. Your, your mum as well played a massive part in your career. Is there, um, do you think parents sometimes have, a negative effect on people in in youth sports do you think they're too harsh on them or do you think they're not harsh enough on them what what do you think obviously you're a dad yourself mate um yeah. and what what do you think about that like the, the harshness of like or oh, should say negatively and positively influences the the child's outcome what what could you I think i think you're right i think they can have a negative impact as well you see 
with me and my dad. My dad was also my coach. So he, he also trained, he was my trainer, he was my dad. You know, as I got a little bit older, he was my boss at work. And so we had, we had different relationships. So when, when me and my dad was in the gym, he was my coach. When we was at home, he was my dad. And when we was at work, he was my boss. And we, we don't get me wrong, we, we did fall out at times and we, we, we sort of had conflicts, but we did tend to try and get a, a good balance where we, we left the gym stuff in the gym, we left work stuff at work, and when we was at home, it was just my dad. And I do feel as though parents can be too pushy or you know not, not pushy enough or whatever, but I feel as though if, if you're a parent and you've got a, a kid that's, say, doing a tech, wants to be a tennis player, and you don't know nothing about tennis, you have to leave it to the coaches. You know, do, you, you find that some parents can be too too involved and don't get involved too much, and they don't really know anything about the sport that the kids are involved in. So yeah, that's where parents can be a ne- have a negative effect. I'm yeah. sure you might get that yourself. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to comment on that. I'm not going to comment on that because uh, I mean, I, I work closely with my parents and for. Our parents, we, we always try and, and say, like, ha, when it's game time, let the kids do the, ki- do the kids. Let them have their decisions, make their decisions. Let's not use words of shoot, kick it, scream, whatever. Just positive influences, positive words. Great job, good try. Keep going, work hard. Um, and, and we feel as though that's a great way for the kids to then make their own decisions, let them get the best out of themselves. For instance, now we're doing virtual training. Yes, we're encouraging parents to get the kids out there, but we're hoping that these kids are going to go out there and do it themselves. We don't want, like you mentioned, the pushy parent. Come on, come on, come on, because we know that that might cause a little bit of friction between soccer and, oh, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it. Um, But, mate, in this time off, uh, what have you been doing to to keep yourself fit, to keep yourself fight ready? I've, when it's all I've been, basically, I've um, I've converted my garage into a gym, and I've um, I've been just training as though I'm in training camp. Do you know what I mean? So nothing, nothing's really changed for me, apart from obviously we're in lockdown, so we can't go out and, and, and socialise with friends and things like that. We can't go to the coffee shops and what have you, but. In my training life, nothing's really changed. You know, I'm training two, three times a day. You know, and I'm eating healthfully, and I'm just living like an athlete should live. So nothing, nothing's changed for me that much. That's amazing, mate. So I mean, even though you're in lockdown, you're still blasting through your sessions, your workouts, your, your, as you say, your training camp. You're your own boss. You're doing your stuff, um, Callum. You're obviously a champion of one of the most courageous sports out there. Um, what advice can you give to young athletes that want to step up to that next level, whether it's to play in their town, to play footy in high school or college, play tennis, golf, or any sport? What advice can you give these young athletes listening to uh, help them achieve their dream? Just work hard. Work hard. Listen to your coaches. Yeah? And never give up. Always believe in yourself as well and don't let failure bother you because you will fail in life you know everybody will fail at something you know the most successful people in the world have failed not once they've probably failed a thousand times you know i've failed loads of times and i'm still failing to this day but you know i'm still achieving things to this day as well so just yeah just just never give up and keep striving to be better than you are because and again try not to be in it's hard not to be in competition with other people when you're in a when you're in sport because Let's be honest, you are competing against others. But always always just try and be better than yourself and, and you'll be what you'll be then. You'll, you'll be as good as you're going to be or you won't be. You know. But just stay positive, try hard, work hard and just try and better yourself every day. Yeah, that, that's brilliant because I, I know I mentioned it in a, lot, a couple of our last interviews that we've had with professional athletes and ex-professional athletes that hard work every everything every pro athlete in the last few interviews has said hard work hard work hard work hard work that's obviously a common piece of evidence that relates to success and brings you success and that's what we keep saying is a controllable you are in control of that so again we we always say to our players work hard work hard work hard obviously it sounds like a repeated record which i used in last interview as a repeated record that hard work is a, a key to success. But 
this is coming from a, a boxing champion, a British light heavyweight champion. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll say the rock. The rock says, "Then he? he said, there's no excuse for not being the hardest worker in the room." And, it, and I say that's that is the only thing. You might not be the most talented, yeah, but there's no reason why you're not the most hard working. And, and like you say, you've got control of that. You know, uh, you've got control of how hard you're going to work. And if you show up to class or to training every single day with the the mindset of 100, percent you know. Everything else will take care of itself. You know, you can't, you, as long as you don't cheat yourself, you'll always be content in what, what you do achieve or what you don't achieve. Because if, if, if you don't achieve it, but you know you've given 100%, you'll always still be of that content that, you know, you, you give it your best shot. Absolutely, absolutely, mate. Callum, no, it's been a pleasure having you with us, mate. One last question. One last question. Are you Go ready on. for this? Go on. Not beanos or crumbs. Crumbs. Yes, yes, lad. Value breakfast. I had, I, had, I had a moment where I was in Delfino's all the time, but I've, uh, I flipped it again. I went back I think, to crumbs. I think, if I remember rightly, I think my mum and Carol said to you, if you win the gold medal at Delhi, there's a free breakfast on the way back when you visit. Yeah, I've had, I've had a few. To be honest, you used to give me one after every fight. I used to go in there. I can't have too many of them. They're not good for the diet, are they? <laughs> they have a nice breakfast though. <laughs> I love it. My mum and Carol will be thrilled to hear that. The omelet, they're, do, they're still doing the best omelette I've ever had. Ah, there we go. Mum will love that. Mum will love that. So, boys, girls, players, coaches, key to a champion, get your crumbs omelettes in there. It's a long way to go for us right now, but... Can you not, can you not freeze them and send them over? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to get her on the shipment, get some sent across. But well, Callum, mate, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been brilliant to hear your stories, your career, your pathway, your advice to our young athletes, our young players, our parents. Um, we truly wish you the best in, in your career with boxing when it picks back up after this craziness is all over. But again, truly, truly thank you for spending your time. Thank you so much for joining us. I don't know if you noticed, but you've had a special guest appearance from the the lady friend back and forth a few yeah. times. Behind every successful man is a lady. Yeah. Love it. I love it, mate. Well, again, thank you. Stay safe. All the best to you and your family, and I'll speak to you soon. Nice one, mate. Take care of yourself. Thank you.